What's up everybody? Andrew Mahoney here with Darium's Competitive Pokemon. I'm going to be showing off the deck that I'm deciding to play at the World Championships here in Anaheim, California. So, this is my finalized list. Literally, this is the morning of the tournament. About to go head over to the opening ceremony here momentarily. Just wanted to get this list in for you guys so you could take a look what I'm playing and see my thought process before the tournament. I'm going to check back in during the rounds and then after the tournament to let you guys know how it all went down. So as you can see, I am playing Gardevoir GX. Uh, probably not a big surprise to a lot of the viewers who have been watching this stuff here for the last couple weeks. I've been testing the deck a lot. Feel pretty confident in it. So let's take a look at the list I decided to run. You can see we started off with a 4-2-4 Guardi line. 4-2-4. So I had been playing a 4-3-4 Gardevoir line, but decided to cut down to 4-2-4 in favor of a fourth rare candy. I felt like the fourth rare candy just helped speed this deck up and make it more responsive. You know, if the deck gets devolved by Espeon, things like that, I really liked the ability to be able to whip up quick Gardevoirs out of nowhere, so I felt like 424 was a nice compromise and worked out just right. I also run the fourth Gardevoir GX, no Gallade, because I like the consistency of just being able to get out as many Gardevoirs as I can as fast as possible. Moving on, I also play two copies of Diancie. I had messed around with one copy of Diancie for a little while. I messed around with a Vulpix split. I even tried Sylveon GX, but Diancie ended up being the most consistent for me. So I really enjoyed that. Play two copies because I like to start it, uh, as well as two copies of Floatstone to help get it into the active position as well. And then, of course, there is Tapu Lele GX. Makes a great attacker in this deck. Uh, just in a pinch, you know, because it attacks for a double colorless energy, and then fairy energy can go towards that energy drive attack as well. Also, just love the ability to be able to hand select the supporter out of the deck. Just makes the deck a lot more consistent. So, playing three copies of that. As far as our techs go, we are playing a 1-1 one, one Machoke line and a Pseudo Wudo. So the 1-1 one, one Machoke line is something that I would kind of been brewing up here for the last month or so, and it's really helped me a lot with the Decidueye matchup, and that's because of Machoke's Daunting Pose ability. And it says, prevent all damage done to your bench Pokemon by your opponent's attacks. Your opponent's attacks and abilities cannot put damage counters on your bench Pokemon. So it's really good against that Decidueye deck, uh, especially because it stops Tapu Koko's Flying Flip as well as Decidueye's Feather Arrow. Then of course, Pseudo Wudo is here for that Roadblock ability in case I happen to play against any Mega Rayquaza deck. So these are the techs. I decided these three cards, I got a lot of value out of them as far as swinging, you know, matchups that I think I'm going to hit. So, you know, that's, that is that. And then, of course, I have my trusty Oranguru, not playing the Octillery. Love the Oranguru just for that Instruct ability. Uh, able to refill your hand to three. Really good if you're getting end to one, end to two, just helping close out games. And in a pinch, you can get in there with his Psychic Attack as well. As far as the supporters go, I play four Sycamore and three N, which I think is pretty standard. Uh, I could play a fourth N, but I feel like with three copies of Tapu Lele, you know, I do pretty good at um, at being able to get supporters out of the deck early, so I felt like this was very sufficient as far as the draw supporters go. Also play one copy of Acerola. You can see I have these nice full art supporters that my friend Frank is letting me borrow. One copy of Guzma. One copy of Lysander. One copy of Hexmaniac. And one copy of Bridget. So... These are all the one-of supporters. They go really well with Versus Seeker. I mean, just being able to select those out. Acerola has been huge in my testing and has been re really good in the mirror. Um, just really good against almost everything since you can pick up a Gardevoir, slap it right back down with Rare Candy, and then accelerate energy as well. So, you know, this uh, split of one-of supporters has proven to be really effective for me so far. I like the one Guzma, one Lysander split, because at the end of the game, sometimes you need a Lysander, sometimes you need a Guzma, and I like the option to pick with Versus Seeker which one you prefer to play. Obviously, Bridget, great, just for starting out the game, getting your bench full of Ralts, and your tech Pokemon like Pseudo Wudo and Machoke. So, we play four Versus Seeker, uh, just to, you know, get those supporters back. That's pretty obvious. I said I'd 
bumped back up to four rare candy. You can see I'm playing four different arts of rare candy. I think that's fun. I really like the rare candy arts. Pretty excited to be playing this card again. So playing four of those just to help speed the deck up. Obviously, we're playing four copies of Ultra Ball to help search our Pokemon out throughout the course of the game. I love that this list just plays 4-4-4, four, 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 you know, it's just, that's what I'm going for, consistency, right? So, you know, play a lot of four of items, and then the items that I'm not playing four of, I'm playing two of, like Field Blower, playing two copies of that because it's very useful against Garbodor and just from, from removing tools from the opponent, also playing two copies of Floatstone. So, that's it for the items. Moving on to the energy, you guys may remember from my post-rotation Gardevoir video that I really like 4 DCE and 9 copies of Fairy Energy. It's going to be tough for me to spread all 9 out, but trust me, there are 9 here. 9 copies of Fairy Energy. That makes it so that, um, you know, you're just consistently drawing into multiple Fairy Energy per turn, so you can really take advantage of Gardevoir GX's Secret Spring ability. Really like nine, I'm not playing any recovery cards in here. You can recover with your Twilight GX attack if you need to, but I feel like nine is just a very optimal number for this deck. So that's it, you know, wish me luck. Hopefully I do well at the World Championships day one here. Gonna see how it goes and I'll check back in in a few. All right, thank you all for watching, peace. So I just got back from the World Championships in Anaheim, California, literally like just got back. My flight flew in at 6 a.m. into Cleveland this morning, so I'm super exhausted. I haven't really slept yet. I went to work, and I just got back, so pretty exhausted. Uh, but I wanted to recap the World Championships in Anaheim, California before I started to forget it all. So I'm here, gonna talk about how my tournament went, what I think I could have done better, and just the overall experience and how things went. So just gonna let you guys kinda hear about all those things and go with it from there. So I played Gardevoir GX, the deck that I just showed off in the previous little clip. I played that exact list in day one of the World Championships. Now, day one did not go all that well for me, even though Gardevoir GX did end up winning the World Championships. So. I'm pretty excited about my deck choice, you know, I picked the right deck, I mean, clearly. So I'm pretty excited about that, you know, my deck choice wasn't bad, so I was reading the metagame and reading, you know, the capability of Gardevoir GX appropriately. So I do feel validated in that respect. Uh, also, if anybody saw, Galissapod GX got second place at the World Championships. So uh, my number one and number two GX cards from my rating video did end up panning out kind of exactly how I had imagined. So that was pretty exciting to see as well and pretty validating even though my tournament experience wasn't exactly the most exciting. So uh, I'm gonna, I took some notes uh, about my matchups here on my phone, just gonna kind of go through those with you guys and let you know what my tournament run was like and then just talk about my overall experience in California. So round one, I'm playing against Andrew Gray, and he is playing a deck that I had tested a lot against leading up to the tournament, a deck that was making me very nervous. It was Garbodor, uh, Trash Alliance, and, and the Garbotoxin Garbodor with Espeon, Drampa, and Potown. So the Espeon EX, uh, he was using to use Miraculous Shrine and devolve all of my Pokemon in play, and then in combination with Potown, just would start to ramp up damage on my evolution lines, all my Gardevoir GXs, and then um, and then would use Drampa to kind of fill in the spots, kind of haze with Righteous Edge, and go in with a big Berserk attack when the time was right. So I tested a lot against this deck leading up to the event. I didn't think too many players would play it, and sure enough, I get paired against it round one. So I'm pretty not excited about that. I was going, <clears throat> I was going even ish against the deck in testing it would really come down to late game ends i would go up four or five prizes early on and then at the end of the game they would lock up garbotoxin and devolve my pokemon and then you know so a lot of times i was left in a situation where i'd have to hit rare candy uh in order to continue attacking and that's because i decided to only run two curlia in my list which was something that i think 
you know, looking back may have been a mistake. I think probably just leaving it at the three Curlia would have offered me the most consistent list that I could have had at the World Championships. I thought that four rare candy would speed my deck up in the way that I wanted it to. Uh, and it did in the few games that I had tested for Rare Candy and two Curlia. However, once I started to get more games in with that list, I realized that I think that the three Curlia and the three, Car uh, three Rare Candy is a better split and would have helped me out with the whole devolving thing with Espeon's Miraculous Shrine. So against Andy Gray, uh, I end up losing a long 35 minute game one, which is really depressing because I thought I was gonna win. It just came down to late game ends and things didn't really buff out. So when you invest that much time into a game just to lose it, it really, really is tough to come back because you only have 50 minutes uh, to complete a best of three series. So I start hustling because I know that we took a really long time on the first game and I know that if I have any, you know, if I have any chance of being able to pull out the series, I need to pretty much just bench my opponent very early in the second game uh, and hope that maybe we have enough time to go on to a, a quick game three and pretty much just got to hope that my opponent dead draws two games in a row, which didn't end up happening. And the way that the world structure is has worked is that the first day of the world championships you need to earn 12 points to qualify you get three points for a win one point for a tie and zero points for a loss and you need 12 to qualify for the second day of the world championships and there were six rounds so you needed to go four and two you could go four and two to get your 12 points or you could go three zero and three ties so uh, ties don't really do you a lot of good unless you get three of them because three ties can add up to a win to help you get that 12 points. I know this, so I start, you know, I start shuffling up for game two, I'm going very quickly, and game two I am able to win just by kind of wiping him out with one big Gardevoir GX and outspeeding him while he stumbled to set up appropriately. Game three starts but naturally doesn't conclude and we end up tying. So that's what happened. It's, it's a very long, grindy format. I think the games can take a long time and it's hard to predict what games you'll end up winning within the first couple turns of the game, especially against a deck like a slow grindy deck like Espeon Garbodor, right? So typically if I had seen that I was going to lose that first game, maybe within the first you know, couple turns, I would have scooped it up and gone to game two much sooner so that game three would have had time to conclude. But I just made a wager thinking that I was going to win game one. That's why I spent so much time on it and it didn't end up buffing out. And so I started out with a round one tie, which is not exactly what I wanted. But at this point, I think maybe I can go three zero and three and get in that way. In 2015, I was able to grind into day two of Worlds with a four zero and three record back in 2015 you needed 15 points in order to advance to the second day of competition and I did that with a four zero and three record so I'm thinking you know maybe I can do a three zero and three record and go on from there uh, my second round I play against a player Lewis from New Zealand and he is playing Decidueye and I end up winning this round. I get my Machoke out very early in the first game and he has, he is very surprised to see that uh, I'm running Machoke in his list, in my list and Machoke ends up getting me there completely against the Decidueye Tapu Koko deck. You know, I mean with the, with the Machoke in my deck, uh, he is not able to use Feather Arrow to damage my benched Ralts or Curlia. He is not able to use Tapu Koko's Flying Flip to damage my benched Ralts or Curlia and Espeon's effect is really negated. So uh, I end up doing very well game one. I'm feeling confident. I got my Machoke out. Game two gets started and I prize both the Machop and the Machoke. I'm only running a 1-1 line as you would have seen in the clip that I'd shown previously and I prize both pieces. And that was, you know, it kind of made me a little nervous. I thought about maybe scooping up game two right away because sometimes it can just turn into a total bloodbath if, you know, you, you don't have anything to prevent your opponent from damaging your bench Pokemon. They can just run you off the table before you even get going. But I did get my pseudo Wudo out, which prevented my opponent from getting as many Decidueye into play as he wanted to. In fact, he was only able to get two Decidueye GX into play during the entire game two, which meant that his 
ability to damage my bench Pokemon was limited. There was a point where he had 40 damage on a Curlia early, and I was able to rare candy another uh, a Ralts into a Gardevoir and Acerola my Curlia up at the same time. So I was able to deny him uh, that prize early on. And I think that that kind of swayed that little play just where I Acerola my Curlia and started evolving it up again was enough to just kind of delay his aggression uh, long enough for me to be able to get going on the right foot and to apply enough damage. And I was able to win game two as well. So we beat Lewis. I built my deck specifically specifically in order to take on Decidueye decks. I thought that Decidueye would be much more popular than it was. So I felt confident going into the third round because my deck functioned. It did exactly what it was supposed to. I had a rough go round one against Garbodor Potown, but that deck was built pretty specifically in order to beat mine. So, you know, my deck did what it set out to do. I beat Decidueye. I thought I would be facing more Decidueye decks. But unfortunately, that was the only one I played during the course of the tournament. Round three, I am playing against a Japanese player, and we are playing a mirror match. So, uh, this is the Gardevoir mirror match. I had tested this a little bit, and I thought that Acerola was really going to set me above my opponent in the mirror match. I thought that this was going to be my key card. We both set up, and we go in with like one or two energy Gardevoir GX, and we can't really exchange one-hit knockouts. So what I thought was going to happen is that we would exchange two-hit knockouts, except that I would win these trades because I would be using Acerola to scoop my Gardevoirs up and to re-evolve them, and that eventually I would deny my opponent enough prizes that way that I would end up winning the game. Now this is how I thought things were going to go. My opponent set up very strong. My opponent was playing a 1-1 split of Diancie and Vulpix. This is something that I had been testing leading up to the tournament. I didn't end up liking it, but in retrospect, I definitely would have wanted to switch to the 1-1 Vulpix Diancie split. I did play two Diancie. I think the 1-1 split is definitely optimal now that I have played through the World Championships. The 1-1 split just allows you to go in with a beacon. If you don't have a floatstone to retreat or something like that, my opponent did not play any floatstones, uh, you would just retreat into the Vulpix early and beacon uh, to grab Pokemon to set up. I mean, he was just evolving straight up through Curlia. He played at least three Curlia and uh, and it was very consistent. My opponent would get like three Gardevoir GX into play on the third turn of the game every game that I played against him. And I had heard from uh, one of my friends that he had been beaten in the mirror match by the same Gardevoir player the, turn, uh, the, the round previous to this. So uh, it was a rough mirror match. My opponent just set up very strong. And what ended up setting my opponent's list above my list is that my opponent played not only great setup cards, was able to set up better than me with Beacon Vulpix just more consistently, but uh, was playing teammates and choice bands. So with teammates and choice band, my opponent was able to get return knockouts on me just way more efficiently than I was able to get return knockouts on my opponent. So even though I had one turn where I thought I was in, like I was gonna win game two, and I end my opponent to low, I end my opponent to like two cards, and my opponent was gonna need a DCE and two fairies in order to knock out my two energy Gardevoir. I had just Field Blower, Field blowered my opponent's uh, choice band off of his Gardevoir GX. So I thought for sure, you know, what are the odds of my opponent getting two fairy and the DCE off an end to two that he needs in order to return a knockout? So my opponent quickly promotes his Gardevoir GX and plays down Versus Seeker and grabs a teammates, right? And teammates for all the cards that he needs in order to get the knockout because he already has the double colorless energy in hand. Now that's pretty unlucky on my part because my opponent got end to two and ended up getting teammates and verse seeker for uh or teammates and double colorless energy because my opponent needed three cards to win and they got two of them right there so pretty unlucky on my part however that's just showcased the power of teammates i was really impressed now some of my friends had suggested that i try teammates in my gardevoir gx deck leading up to the tournament, but I thought to myself, like, how often am I really gonna use teammates? Gardevoir GX isn't supposed to get knocked out that often. 
Teammates to me seemed like a card that would be better in a deck like Garbodor, where you're trying to trade your Garbodors back and forth pretty quickly, or Night March, where your Night Marchers get knocked out all the time. It didn't really make sense to me in a deck where you have a 230 hit point GX. I was like, how often am I really going to use teammates? My opponent showed that teammates can be very effective, because when your Gardevoir GX does go down, you want to whip one up very quickly and efficiently in order to deal with whatever threat took it out. I think teammates would have definitely helped me throughout the case of the uh, throughout the course of the tournament, just for being able to respond whenever my Gardevoirs did get taken out. So that was a blind spot that I had had. I had admittedly not put much time into testing teammates in Gardevoir, just because I thought that. I thought that it wasn't going to be all that great, but my opponent was able to use teammates effectively in the mirror match in order to ensure that he hit one-hit knockouts when I was not hitting one-hit knockouts. So uh, my opponent's deck was just so aggressive and so strong and just built so well that I never even got to use Ace Arola. I thought for sure maybe if I keep one or two energies only on my Gardevoir GXs that I will be able to use Ace Arola effectively to heal them, but my opponent made sure that I was never given that opportunity and just one hit knock out my Gardevoirs very efficiently. So that was how that went. So at this point, I am one, one, and one. I need to win out in order to have a chance at day two. I have three rounds left and I need to win them all. So I'm not feeling too great at this point. I really am a little bummed that I tied the first round and I feel like I could have won that matchup, but it was just a tough matchup. My opponent's deck was designed specifically to beat mine and then losing a mirror match always feels bad. But I have to admit the Japanese player that I played was just very good. He was a very quick and efficient player. His list was very, very well thought out. So I didn't really feel too bad losing to him because you know, his deck was just really great and I very I very much admired it and just I learned a lot from our experience that I could bring back to the table here and share with you all. So it was an enriching experience and at least I got something out of it. On to the next round, I'm playing against Espeon Garbador and I'm playing against a player from Spain, very nice guy, and it ends up getting down to the wire, uh, and we're just trading back and forth. I win game one, he wins a long game two, and we're on uh, to game three, and game three comes down to just a confusion flip. And if I, and it's literally like a 50-50, it's like turn three of time, and if I, my only way to win the matchup is to attack it through confusion and hope that I'm able to knock out my opponents Espeon GX. And so basically, you know, it's a 50 50 shot. There is no turn four of time. There are judges watching, so I have to flip for it. And I end up flipping and it goes through. The attack works and I end up winning that way. So very intense game there. Pretty much just skidding by. Uh, but at 2 1 and 1, I was feeling pretty confident like, okay, maybe this is actually doable. I can actually win my final two rounds of Swiss and make it in to the next day. I am already have so many things that I would like to have changed about my list, uh, especially after playing that mirror match and ways that I want to alter my list if I do qualify for the second day of the World Championships. But I do have two more rounds to go and unfortunately my tournament run ends right there because the next deck that I play against is another Garbodor Potown uh, deck and my opponent is also playing Tapu Fini GX. So the Tapu Fini GX, it has that Tapu Storm GX attack. Now, I had actually seen Tapu Fini seeing some play in Greninja decks, Greninja break decks leading up to the World Championships. I didn't think it, that it was going to be all that good in Greninja, but it actually ended up making a lot of sense. Because if your opponent is able to kind of cook up a Pokemon that is able to just mow down Greninjas early, you can promote Tapu Fini GX and use Tapu Storm, and Tapu Storm shuffles the whole Pokemon back into the opponent's deck. So my opponent was able to use this strategy effectively in his Garbodor deck, and I hadn't really tested against it all that much in Garbodor, and it just ended up, I was drawing awkward hands, things were going weird for me, I wasn't setting up, the deck was operating slowly, and I ended up losing. Uh, but any anytime I got a big Gardevoir going to take out a Drampa or something like that, my opponent swiftly was able to just punish me by bringing out Tapu Fini GX and shuffling the Pokemon back into the deck and making me find another Gardevoir 
you know, especially when Garbo Toxin was up, you know, uh, Garbodor's ability was up, shutting down my abilities, made it very hard for me to kind of stream attackers and just get things going. So I uh, had a very good deck, lost to Charlie Lockheeler. Uh, Lockheeler, I don't know how to say his last name, but Charlie, a uh, good player from the United States and uh, was just a nice guy to play against. So. Uh, lost against Charlie, and unfortunately my tournament run ended there because at 2-2-1 two, two and one, I know that I cannot qualify for the second day of the World Championships at this point, and I end up just dropping from the tournament to go enjoy Anaheim, California with Kirsten and just kind of try to move on, and I'm a little, I'm a little bummed, a little disappointed, of course, but like I said, I learned a lot from this tournament experience and felt like there was, uh, I was ready to kind of move on and move forward and continue to grow with this format that we have, with these new cards that we have. At the end of the day, uh, you know, after the World Championships had concluded, I was excited, you know, seeing the deck that I had chosen, Gardevoir, win the whole thing. So I was excited about that. Uh, we had built our list very differently, which is something that I'll talk about in some upcoming videos, you know, uh, and I will give, you know, I will give, um, I'll give these changes a try. My opponent did play the Octillery and the Gallade, which is not something that I was too hype on leading up to the World Championships, but sometimes, you know, you got to admit, hey, something did work out. I'm definitely going to have to give this a try heading forward with my future builds of Gardevoir GX. So, uh, a couple other things I was able to do in Anaheim. We all went to Disney uh, early on in the trip. That was a lot of fun. Went to Disneyland and just got to kind of see uh, that park for the first time. So, I was super stoked on that. Had a lot of fun uh, with Kirsten. Also ended up going to Huntington Beach a few times, and that was just a really fun experience. They have, like, food right there on the beach, you know, little taco trucks, things like that. You could just go up, get your food, and then just, like, go straight out to the beach, enjoy the sun. Really hot out there, just beautiful water. There are people actually surfing. It was, like, really cool. So really had a great time doing all of that as well. Went out to eat a bunch. There was some great food and uh, just had, had an excellent time overall in Anaheim, California. Unfortunately, it didn't buff out for me heading into the second day of the World Championships, but still had a great time nonetheless. So, excited about the future of the format. I'm excited about, you know, the upcoming regionals. The first regionals that I'm gonna be attending is Fort Wayne Regionals, uh, which is going to be expanded. So, uh, we're gonna be getting into a little bit of expanded format in the upcoming weeks, as well as some new stuff from the standard format and I'm excited to be bringing all that to you. So thank you all for watching my Worlds recap video. Hope you all are excited as I am to get started with this new season heading forward into the 2017-2018 season. And I hope you guys uh, will follow along with me in your journeys to the next World Championships in Knoxville, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so super excited about the World Championships in Nashville, Tennessee next year. Hopefully, I will get to see you all there. Thank you all for watching. Take it easy. Peace.